Oh, hope you're all doing fine and well on this non-sunny day. So today's lesson, we're going to look at critical essay writing, basically how to structure your main body paragraphs. So our word of the day, uncanny. I like the way you say that, uncanny. It's an adjective and it means something that's strange or mysterious, especially something in a kind of unsettling way. So for example, the woman had an uncanny feeling that she was being watched. Today's spelling word, difference. Differ. To differ means to change or to be varied from. So just remember, differ ends. It's got two E's. Pun of the day, assault with a deadly weapon. <laughs> okay. So, first question for you. Which tense should critical essays be written in? Shout it at me. Shout it at the screen. I can hear you. Alright, I remember this from my own English teacher a couple of years back. They said, uh, unlike us, literature never dies. So we should always use the present tense because it never dies. So it's continually existent. Something to get you thinking. All right, so the main body paragraphs, just like the introduction, I've got a little mnemonic. So that's a thing that, you know, is like a word that makes you remember the different stages or the different steps. So for critical essay main body paragraphs, I use the mnemonic pair. So pair paragraphs. Now each teacher has something slightly different. We can have pair paragraphs, peer paragraphs, peel paragraphs, PEE -E paragraphs. They're, they're all the same thing, right? It's just we all like our own different way of explaining it. So pair stands for point, evidence, analyze, and refer. So how do you start a critical essay? If I had a fiver for every time a kid was sitting looking gazumped, not knowing where to start. So I always say, go with the flow. If you follow my structure, then you'll have a big massive paragraph that talks about the beginning of the text, then another one that looks at the middle, and another one that looks at the end. Now I'm just saying that loosely speaking, but that's sort of how to try and plan it in your head. What is going on in the beginning, in the middle, and at the end? And it doesn't matter if it's a play, a massive novel, or a short poem, it doesn't matter, the same applies. So what's a point? So if you make a point, just like, a, you know, if you're in an argument with someone or you're in a debating team, you make your point, they make their point. That's the same here. You're arguing something. So you're telling me something about the text in a sentence. So you might have heard of a topic sentence, you know, looking at the persuasive essay structure I went over. But here it's the same thing. You're just giving me a fact about the text. This should be relevant though. So if you're doing an essay about character, I wouldn't expect this point to be something about the setting. Okay, sometimes you can link it to another technique, but focus on what the task's asking you to do. So it's one sentence. You can try and mention a technique if you can. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. But you should also then, once you've made a fact statement, then expand it. So remember, I don't know the text or pretend I don't. I don't mean I want you to tell me the plot or the story, but I just mean give me a fact in one sentence and then expand it into another sentence. So give me a little bit more information or put it into some kind of context that it makes sense for me to understand it if I've not read it before. So just tell me a little bit about what's going on. So that's only another sentence. So here's an example of a point. From the beginning of the short story, the character of the sniper is immediately interesting. So I've underlined that because that's what the question is. An interesting character question. Because he's portrayed as a young man, yet he's clearly been influenced by war. Next sentence, so this is the bit that's given me a bit more context, a bit more information. We know this because the writer suggests how it has physically affected him. Da, 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 da. So just think. There's two sentences before a quote, okay? So the quote or the evidence, that's your E. So just like if you're given evidence in court, where were you on the day of the crime? I was here, there's my receipt. 
the evidence is used to support and back up what you've just said in your point and the next sentence. So that's why you should never open a critical essay paragraph with a quote because the job of a quote is to back up something that you've said. You've got to argue something or give me a fact first. So you should never open with a quote. The quotes should be really importantly picked. You have to take your time over them. They have to be relevant to the question, the essay question, plus to what you've just said. But you also want to pick the quotes that you can really analyse in depth. So, you know, you want to show off what you know in this part of the exam. Where possible, depending on the circumstances, usually you need to try to embed quotes. So that's put them into a sentence. Don't have them hover in the middle of the page. It, embedding helps your essay flow better and it just improves the overall structure. So here's an example of embedding. O'Flaherty emphasises the sniper's grown obsession by stating that his eyes had the cool gleam of the fanatic, which helps to portray him as a disturbed young man. You'll see how I don't stop at any point, I just keep going, so that's why the essay flows better if you embed your quotes. Also, just a little pointer, the word which is a joining word, so it joins what you're arguing with the quote to something afterwards. I don't know how many times over my career I saw the word this at that point instead of which. This is not a joining word. So don't use it after a quote unless you've got a full stop. Then you're starting with, this helps to portray him, blah, blah, blah. But don't use this as a joining word because it's not. Another example, the soldier being drafted out was initially admired and respected by the public. As we are told, he was drafted out to drums and cheers. And then I would go on to do the next step, the really important one, which is analyse. Right? This is the biggest section of your whole main body paragraphs. This is where, unlike the Rui where you're doing some, a short, succinct answer, this is where I want you to plump it out. This should be as chubby as you can in the analysis bit. So this is your opportunity to show the SQA what you know, or the teacher, what you know about this text and the techniques, how many techniques you know, and more importantly, why they're effective. So I always make a reference to the X factor. This is your X factor moment. So you need to tell the marker or the teacher or the reader what techniques you know, but why they're used. And this is where you can give me a variety of reasons. It's not just one definitive answer in English, which is why it's different from you know subjects that have statistics and things with facts. You know, we've got a lot of grey areas and that's where a lot of kids struggle because they're not sure what's the right answer. And there isn't always a right answer. It could be a variety. It's your opinion that we want here. So this is where basically you're going to identify and discuss techniques, say why they're effective, what do they add to the text, you know, what do we gain from them. So in general, you should tell me the technique first, then quote it and then analyse it. So for example... The simile, so you're identifying the technique first, then quote it. I don't like starting sentences with quotes. I'm a bit like that, so you don't need to do that. Give me the technique first. That's where you should be, you know, expanding your knowledge on it. So the simile, like dogs barking on lawn farms, is effective as it emphasises the huge volume of the rifle shots, which contrasts, so there's another technique, with the silence of the city's empty streets. Comparing them to dogs is also successful as, and then you would go on and talk about that in a bit more detail, maybe what the connotations of a dog would suggest about, you know, war or guns or whatever. Right, so the way that you analyse will vary depending on what genre of literature that you're doing. So you're not always going to be talking about word choice, for example. If you're doing a large novel or a play, then you've got to sort of think on a bigger scale. So you'd be looking at character. What do you know about the character? How does the character act? What do we know about their personality? That sort of thing. Setting. How does the setting influence the plot and things like that? Or the character's behaviour? A key scene in a play or an incident in prose. Climax. So these are the sorts of techniques and words, you know, terminology that I would expect you to use throughout your essay to show that you're analysing that correct genre properly. If you're doing a poem, for example, that'll change slightly. 
So you'll be looking at techniques such as word choice, imagery, sound, rhythm, structure, tone, these sorts of things. Now that's not to say you can't look at word choice for prose, but it's more looking at like the whole character or the whole set and that sort of thing instead of honing in on a little word. That's much more poetry based. So the way that you analyse techniques will vary and the way you approach them will vary depending on the genre. Alright, the last section is R, which is refer. Now, this is a crucial point in the paragraph structure because this is basically one sentence that goes back to the essay question. So you use the exact words or similar words to the essay question. So what that does is it makes sure that you're focusing on the question, but it shows the marker that you're also honing in on that and making sure that everything you've said so far in the PEA is relevant. And obviously, most people will fail the critical essay because you've memorised an essay in advance, you walk in, you write it down, expect it to be amazing, and it's nothing to do with the questions that are in front of you. So you can't do that. You have to, it's like a jigsaw piece. You've got your knowledge of the text, your quotes that you've memorised and the analysis, and the question on the day, and it's about marrying them all together. That's what you're doing in this part of the exam. So the R is basically one sentence that sums up how everything that you've said here is relevant. So for example, here, so you could start with that, the word here, this character is fascinating, that was the question, so that's why I'm putting it in, despite his youth, oh sorry, because, and then I'm summing up what I've said in PEA, Despite his youth, he has clearly experienced trauma and conflict which have altered his outlook on life. So that's the one sentence that tells the marker and you that everything I've said is relevant and I'm on my way to getting a good pass in this essay. At times though, so that we're not seeing the word fascinating, you know, 12 times in an essay or whatever it is, try to expand your vocabulary so it does get boring as a teacher and a marker to see that same word, fascinating, 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 it's not fascinating after a while. So try and jazz that up. So I always say to kids, when you've got the essay in front of you, the question, highlight the keyword. I'll do another um, lesson on that on Monday. Highlight the keyword and then underneath it, just write two or three alternatives and then try and jazz up your vocabulary at times throughout it. So instead of fascinating, for example, you can have enthralling, intriguing, interesting, captivating, gripping, hypnotic, anything like that, riveting, you know, there's a variety of words. Or if the question, say, for example, was a key moment, other ways you could write that, crucial incident, you know, think about alternatives to the word key, alternatives to the word moment, significant event, important occurrence. So do that underneath and then try and vary it a little bit. But you're still answering the question and we'll know that. It's just that we like to see that detailed vocabulary, developed vocabulary. In my opinion, depending on how much analysis you've put in, sometimes you might need to do two pairs in one paragraph. So that makes it like massive, almost like an A4 page. And there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes I prefer kids to do that because then you've got two pair paragraphs about the middle of the text, then, the, you know, sorry, the beginning, the middle, then the end, so that you've, you've got a clear structure and you know what you're doing. And it makes it a wee bit less just panicky for you as well if you can sort of think about it, beginning, middle, end. So it depends on the size of your paragraph, but you can join two pair paragraphs together to condense them into a sort of super giant paragraph. It looks more detailed as well and more developed, so if it's a little bit short, feel free to do that, okay? And that's how to do the main body. I hope you found that handy. So you can do P-E-A-R in the margin until you get confident that you know what you're doing. Even if you were doing that on the, on the day of the exam, you know, as SQA markers, we get used to seeing these sort of mnemonics, so don't worry about it. But you can try and do it mentally once you've had a bit of practice. So on Monday, we're going to do how to do a conclusion in a critical essay. Again, I'd be a rich lady if I had a fiver for every time a kid said, I can't do a conclusion. How do you do a conclusion? I don't even know what a conclusion is, what I'm doing. So we'll do that lesson on Monday. And then Tuesday, we're going to look at uh, essay questions, how to pick them and what to do once you've got it and that sort of thing. And then we're going to have a little bit of fun on Wednesday, Thursday, since that's the last days of term. Yeah!
if you haven't done so please like subscribe and join my aim higher facebook page you can get access to lots of resources for free that will help you and some revision help and get on to my youtube channel and please subscribe if you're not on facebook there are the links to the google classroom where you can access all the resources and the powerpoints as well and if you'd like to say thanks then just send me a wee powder too to keep me going and cup to tea 